All right, I'm going to do a video showing you examples from Scripture of when the children of Israel were actually acting independently of God's will. And I'm doing this to show that Calvinism is false when it says, when they basically take Ephesians 1 11 out of context and say that basically everything that happens is God's will. Okay, and I've done videos showing that Ephesians 1 11 is in the context of the life of a Christian, and these scriptures prove that there are things that happen that are not God's will, and Israel was acting independently of God's will. There were times when that happened, so let's get right into the scriptures. So, first, uh, like I said, Israel acted in a rebellious way that was clearly against God's will. Here's one such example of that. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 to 3. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they add sin to sin. They walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. You know, they're saying that basically they take counsel, but not of me. They were acting in a rebellious manner that was not God's will. Another example of this is the fact that Israel set up kings apart from God's will. Hosea chapter 8, verse 4. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not, of their silver and their gold. They, have they made them idols, that they may be cut off? They set up kings, but not by me. They are not doing it in accordance to God's will. It was against God's will. Uh, more proof of this, of them acting independently of God's will, and that they have the ability of, of contrary choice, uh, is the fact that God uses metaphorical language to express the fact that he had set up Israel for success, but it ended up turning up, it basically turned out the other way that was against his will. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20, verse 20 down to verse 22. says, For of old time I have broken thy yoke, and burst and burst thy, ban thy bands, sorry, and thou sayest, I will not transgress, when upon every when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot yet i had planted thee a noble vine holy a right seed how then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me for thou for though thou wash thee with nitre hope i'm saying that right and take thee um, take thee much soap yet thine iniquity is marked before yet thine yet thine iniquity sorry is marked before me saith the lord god you know uh, he's using his metaphorical language. Israel's the base of the vine, the vineyard, essentially. And he was setting them up for success, but they are into all this basically degenerate iniquity. He's saying it in the verse there. More examples of this. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Uh, sorry, his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard, a very fruitful hill. He fenced it, it gathereth it gathered out of the st uh, gathered out the stones thereof, sorry, and planted it with the with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked at there that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could it have been done more to my vineyard than I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked at it, it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now go to, I, t I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will uh, lay it waste. It shall not be, it shall not be pruned nor digged, uh, but there shall come up barriers and thorns. I will also I will also command the clouds that they rain that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. So again, he's trying to set this vine the vineyard up for success, but then they is he is it essentially he thought it would bring forth good fruit, but then it brought forth evil fruit. Essentially brought forth grapes, but then brought forth wild grapes instead. It was against his will. They were acting in independence of God's will. And again, not going to just read things on the computer, so just bear with me. More examples of this, of Israel acting independently of God's will, is the fact that God expressed legitimate expectation of repentance and righteousness from Israel, but this, expe this expectation was not met by Israel. They failed his expectation. Uh, basically, they acted against his will. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. 
They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her, her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have they have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. I have cut off the I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste, and none, that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed, so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. And I said, Surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever I punish them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. He's trying to get them to repent, he's trying to chasten them and punish them, but they still won't repent. He's saying, Look, now you're going to repent, but they still refuse to do so. They kept acting against his will. The power of free choice. And you'll see in the other verses, you know, that. That when you read the whole thing and you read other examples of when this happened, God holds them accountable. You see, it's personal accountability. You have no one to blame but yourself for your sins. But if Calvinism are true, you just blame God for your sins. That's the logical conclusion. If God causes sin, if everything that happens is God's will, well, then it was God's will they would disobey him, even though he's expressing uh, otherwise. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 14 to 16 says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up bedtimes and sending, uh, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused, misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy." So the bottom line is, is that, you know, God wanted them to repent. God wanted them to turn from their wickedness, you know, showing that sin was not God's will or God's ordained, preordained will for them. But they refused to do so. And then when God does pour wrath on them, they had no one to blame but themselves because they chose to act in a manner that was against God's will and act in sin and wickedness. You see, but with Calvinism, it destroys any kind of personal accountability. Because if you have no free will, then everything, every, every sin you do is just God's, God's will for you. So when God's punishing you, he's basically just punishing you for what he, for just doing what he, what he preordained you to do. That's the logical conclusion of Calvinism. Plain and simple. Calvinism is an attack, a blatant attack on the righteousness and character of God. And the stuff that gets proves that when they were acting independently of God's will, you know, it's not man-centered theology because it means that God was, had every right and every, was in the total, basically God was in the right for punishing them for their sins. Plain and simple. That's not man-centered, that's actually God-centered theology. It's actually Calvinism that is the man-centered theology. So anyway, don't be deceived by Calvinism. It is a false doctrine. It is a heresy, plain and simple. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.